All right, so I don't have anyone in the waiting room to come in, so I will start the webinar. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Charlotte Panton toko ingoa. Hello everyone and welcome to what is the second webinar in our series for the year. My name is Charlotte Panton and I am a communications advisor for Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. If you've seen the animation series about COVID-19 by Toby Morris and Dr. Susie Wiles from the spin-off, you might already agree that art has the power to connect and explain really complex science. Today, we're gonna to hear about The Unseen, an art and science research project that investigated art as a way to communicate the complex and often invisible and intangible world of marine science. Many of you here today are from all corners of the world. No mai haere mai, welcome. I appreciate that the time differences may mean it's an early or late start for you. Just so you know, we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel later. So we are also joined by people from around New Zealand, from the science communication community, central and local government, universities, museums, and other Crown Research Institutes. Thank you all for being here. Before they start, I'd really like to say a big thank you to our speakers, Gabby O'Connor, Carolyn Lundquist, and Joa Callahan. These past few weeks, months for everyone has been the ultimate test of work-life balance. And I really want to recognize um, you all for pulling this webinar together while wearing many other hats. I know it's not easy, so thank you. I'll leave it up to them to introduce themselves in the project, but the fact there's so many people here today and there's been a lot of interest in the unseen since it began, says a lot about this awesome work. Just a quick note on the structure of the webinar. Gabby's gonna speak first and talk about her research and the inspiration behind the unseen. Carolyn then will provide a marine ecology perspective of the research, followed by Jo, who will talk about her experience from an oceanographer's perspective. Gabby will then jump back in to talk about the results and that will be then followed by about a 15, 20 minute uh, conversation where you can ask have a Q&A session. So keep track of your questions during the session and um, read them out or uh, talk to them at the end. Um, Hakona mai, over to you, Gabby. Okay, um, kia ora koutou. Um, so my name's Gabby O'Connor and I'm an artist, but I've been conducting this um, PhD research project since 2017. And um, I just want to thank both Carolyn and Joe for participating in this webinar with me, but also for participating in the research. Um, I also need to, there we go. So the Unseen is an art, marine science and community engagement project, but it's also many other things as well at the same time. And um, so I'm actually structuring this webinar similarly to the um, workshops that we ran in various communities in New Zealand over the last few years. And so the way um, the workshops work um, is that um, I will do a very, very brief in, um, introduction and then I'll actually hand it over to the scientists to um, communicate their research. And then we allow time for Q and A. And then we, um, the participants, we, we um, collaborate in partners and these partners expand to larger groups um, to, until the entire group has made a singular object together that maps knowledge whilst also creating an experience um, that is rich with um, a wide range of kind of ideas of knowledge. Um, I think it's also important um, that I need to thank both my past and current collaborators, including um, my other supervisors, Karen and Alice, and all of the um, other scientists that participated in this specific project, as well as the scientists that I've collaborated with previously. It's part of a continuum and no art or science project can is a, done by a single person. We all rely um, very heavily on our relationships and our ability to um, make things together because that's how we make new knowledge. Um, I just want to start with this, or leave with this little image. Um, so I took this in Antarctica in 2015, and it's um, it's basically it's a photo of this. It's a film of this rope. Um, at the end of the rope is an instrument that's going down to measure the ocean through the sea ice, and there's about 500 meters of ocean below us. And um, 
in order for the rope not to be tangled and the um, instrument to judder as it goes down, um, the technician, Brett, he very carefully kind of um, allowed the rope to leave his hand. And I was looking at it and it's like, it's for me, it looked like a drawing, this kind of um, an animated drawing. And this actually sparked the idea for my current PhD research project, like using rope as both um, an art material for drawing material, but also as a cooperative technology, whilst recognising its connection to um, as a technology that's enabled a lot of um, marine research as well as marine transportation through history. So I'll stop myself from going on any further. I'd like to hand over to Carolyn Lundquist, who's going to share um, her experiences with the research. Thanks, Carolyn. All right, am I unmuted, Charlotte? Hopefully. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, so, um, Kiritato, Ko Carolyn, Lundquist, Aho, He Kaimatai, Kayo Naniwa, Aho. I'm a research scientist at Niwa um, up here in Hamilton, and I'm also um, on the faculty of the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Auckland. And so I also have this wonderful role where I'm one of Gabby's PhD supervisors. So I sit in that role as well. And I remember as we were um, building up the specs on what we were going to do on this project, um, the fun bits of learning about how many cable ties and how much rope and all sorts of exciting things of recycling the rope and the materials as well that came up in the conversation. So just how to make sure that what we were uh, presenting was being used, but also being recycled. So um, in case we don't have a chance to mention that. I think that was an, an important part of almost the prep for this. Um, but where I came in is I um, got to do four of the presentations to schools in Havelock and then um, in that area in the Tasman and Golden Bay areas. Um, I think uh, Gabby will introduce probably how many total schools and total students that we did present to, as well as a number of um, schools in the Wellington area and also at um, Christchurch at the physics room at one of the, the art museums that I also participated in. Uh, now, from a science perspective, um, usually we all come in talking to scientists. So we're used to talking to scientists, occasionally to uh, managers, so uh, people who work in regional and central government, sometimes to industry. But school children is a whole new environment, often for most scientists, to talk to. And so a lot of it, as Charlotte mentioned, it's how do we actually make sure we're speaking in terminology that others can understand. And that huge value of art, for example, with Susie and Toby's work with the COVID-19, things that have all been uh, published on um, the spinoff uh, that many of you have seen, these wonderful diagrams that, and cartoons that help all of us to understand exactly how COVID-19 works and how different scenarios and models work, how the spread of things happen. That's just one great example of how art can be used to help all of us understand how something works. So I was coming in with this marine ecology perspective, but also realizing I do have my own children. There's some pictures of them up there. They're now 11 and 14. And so I do quite a bit of bringing my children out in the field with me and trying to explain to them what's going on. So I have a little bit of experience, but it's a whole different experience when you're walking in a front of a group of anywhere from 20 to 100 students and the age ranges were quite large. We had everything from year zero students at age five all the way up through high school year 17. And the group of schools that I went to um, were primarily rural schools. So often we had uh, the entire age range. Um, so from year zero to year 12 or 13 in the same classroom at the same time. So it was quite a bit of fun. Um, but also a slightly scary experience because you never know what school children are going to ask you and you have to make sure that you're using terms that they actually understand. Excuse me, Carolyn, just before you um, jump onto the next slide, the screen sharing is, is, the present, is not the presentation. Could you again. just switch screens? Sorry. Thank you. We had it all prepared in advance. <laughs> we did. We didn't do it. Okay. 
it's not sharing and I don't know why. Hmm. All right. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. All right. So, um, so coming into the groups of schools that we were working in, I think I had two main objectives that I wanted to get across. First was to share a bit of natural history. So um, I work primarily in estuaries and shallow coastal zones. So helping the children to know a bit more about the um, marine environment for the next time that they actually went out and experienced this, the sea. But then the second bit was to try and help connect them to their daily lives, potentially what their parents' occupations were, and how the things on land actually influence what's going on in the sea. And so the area that we were working, again, is quite a rural area, but the majority of the people are employed in forestry, fishing, farming, and aquaculture, for example, with the greenlet mussels here in Havelock. Uh, so trying to connect both the children to the natural history of the sea and then connecting the mountains to the sea. See if I can get this to share. There we go. All right, and so a lot of what I work on is what you might actually call the unseen in the sand flats. So your average child, when they walk on a sand flat, some of them will know how to find kippies and cockles, but often they won't know what's underneath. So what I was introducing the children to was this is just a side on view, a little diagram of what's under the sea. So with the water on top, we have all these things, whether it's worms or clams, all sorts of different types of animals that actually live underneath and in the sand. And if you know what they are, it makes it quite fascinating to actually figure out things about their life histories. And this ended up being a whole set of conversations that we had while the children were doing their drawing, which also shows some pictures of in a moment. Um, and um, what Gabby did at the end of each workshop was we had postcards. And so this just allowed the children to reflect on their own experience. So one of the questions they all got to answer was, what was the coolest thing that you discovered about the marine environment? And um, it was quite exciting to see how many of them were actually listening and learning at the same time as drawing and making art. Um, and so for this child, for example, they said that um, they realize that when you walk on the sand bank that you have walked on animals so that they're actually learning and the next time that they'll go out in the ocean, they'll actually go and probably dig up and look and see what they can find there. Um, we um, had lots of discussions on different types of animals and different ways that animals use um, the, um, the sand flat. So for example, many of them are quite familiar with mud crabs scurrying about and we had lots of drawings coming up of these mud crabs. But I also explained quite a bit about mud crab burrows. So for example, if you see that middle picture, you see the burrows, but um, most of the children would have guessed initially that those were four or five crabs and each one had one burrow. But actually, if you put in a bit of resin, so that kind of funky skeletal uh, picture just to the right with the black background, you actually find that most of these crab burrows are quite extensive and complex networks uh, that's just dropping this resin in and peeling it out and taking all the sand away and you can see that there are a huge number of entrances and exit ways as these crabs are wandering around underneath the mud and creating all sorts of exciting little pathways where they can escape from predators and so this was yet another thing that a lot of the children really um, found exciting and here's just one of the drawings that they made here this is with rope and cable ties trying to draw, draw both the crabs themselves as well as those burrow structures. And then polychaetes. Many of the children had no idea that we had marine worms. So what are these marine worms? Where do they live? Um, this picture, if you can see those kind of sticky uppy bits, those are actually worm tubes. And so I was then able to show them a whole bunch of different types of uh, what marine worms look like. And personally, I find marine worms particularly fascinating because I seem to see them coming up in a lot of Peter Jackson's and other New Zealand um, uh, film, films where we see a lot of these very scary alien monsters, but they're actually often built on jaw structures and things like that of marine worms. So the one on in the bottom middle, if you can see, they're kind of black bits right in the middle of this worm. 
but it actually basically everts the entire jaw and comes out and goes, you know, rah, like a giant alien monster. So um, again, using techniques like this to allow the children to both see and learn and realize that life history. Um, and I think most of them had probably seen at least some Peter Jackson movie or some alien movie at some point in their life. So they could really connect and see how real life was actually used in movies as well. Oh, and there's one of the drawings of one of the polychaetes that these marine worms that uh, one of the children or the pairs of children made. Uh, and then one other life history, uh, natural history lesson. So here again, this is a picture of a sand flat and most people probably have no idea what these little holes are. They're paired holes. And in fancy science speak, we call these an inhalant and an exhalant siphon. Um, in other words, they're parts of the cockle, the straw that they use to suck water in and the straw that they use to push the water back out again after they filtered all the nutrients and all the good bits out that they want to eat. And so a lot of children also really enjoyed learning about how cockles and pippies have straws and how they filter feed out of the water column in order to eat. So really getting that natural history lesson across, but also by making sure that we were using terminology that the children could understand. And so again, that second bit that I really wanted to get across to the children was really about connecting the mountains to the sea. And so a lot of what we do in working on New Zealand estuaries and coasts is trying to manage for land-based inputs like sediments and nutrients and other pollutants that enter from our waterways and often end up being deposited in streams. So for example, many of you have probably seen something like this picture up at the top. This is the Waimakariri in Canterbury where you see this plume of sediment coming out into the ocean, but it's basically we have either rainfall or um, rainfall events typically and a large amount of rain will see slips and that mud from land will eventually make it into our streams and then from the streams is transported into the estuaries and coasts. And so we know this has an effect on um, the animals in the coast through both making the water a lot muddier for smothering when that sand lands down on the bottom of the seafloor. So this was another conversation we had with the children, both about sediments as well as um, having conversations about nutrients. So things like cow poo. Um, and the children really love talking about poo because that's how children are, but connecting what happens on land with what's on the coast. And I think the, um, the postcard comments that we had from the children, um, quite a number of them actually recognized this connection between land and sea and really thought it was quite interesting to know that what happened on land actually influenced things downstream. Um, so with that, I will, um, I will conclude and uh, turn back to uh, Gabby, but uh, just really a fascinating and wonderful experience just um, working with the children and helping them to bring in some new concepts about uh, marine ecology. Oh, so we're just going to hand over to Jo who's going to um, present her talk. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, we can see your screen, Joe, but it's not the presentation. Yeah. Oh, no one. Brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Hena koutou uh, My name is Joe O'Callaghan. I'm a physical oceanographer based at Newar in Wellington. I did many workshops with Gabby for the Unseen project. Most of these were based in Nelson. We would uh, go out in the morning and the afternoon and work through some often very large groups of children through the process that Gabby described. And so um, it was certainly intense art sciencing experience for both of us and I'm sure she'll talk through some of that a bit later. Uh, intense but incredibly rewarding and as I'll get to a little bit later, some from a science, scientist perspective, some instantaneous feedback that often isn't something that we get usually in our, in our um, 
uh, scientific process. So what I'll do today is just quickly give you a tiny bit of what I do as a scientist and then how I, my involvement in the workshops and then and some of my thoughts from a scientist, not an artist perspective. So I'm a physical oceanographer. I work in the shelf seas around New Zealand. So this is the place where people work and play. Uh, it's close to land often, but not always. Uh, so these are the beautiful satellite images that, that many of us are familiar with. But when we move into a little bit more detail, the area of my science is these sorts of, these whirls and swirls, these eddies in the ocean. Uh, we can see them from maps, from space. But most importantly, and I guess most, you know, for the unseen project is what happens below the surface. So this is, this is our uh, larger and smaller eddies that we see. But from my science perspective, it's, it's taking not just a plan view, but a horizontal perspective of uh, what happens when a river goes into the ocean. How does it mix and move uh, the water, nutrients, plastics, all kinds of uh, implications for ocean ecosystems. So this is sort of the science that is, uh, doesn't have the luxury of critters that uh, some of the students or kids might be more familiar with. So it's making connections to them was something that I gave a bit of thought to before we went into schools. And so uh, there's some nice analogies with things that people are used to seeing, the weather. You know, people, uh, families talk about the weather when they might go and do something. And so uh, translating some of these ideas that are subsurface to concepts that are familiar. So ocean weather. This here is a, a nice frontal system coming into Wellington. You can see on one side we've got some very large turbulent uh, weather. Uh, and so this is the sort of pictures that occur under the ocean that are much more difficult to uh, understand, but also comprehend when you're trying to explain complexity. Um, the tools that uh, I used to understand this ocean weather in, in my science and also in the workshops was ocean robots. It was a tangible thing. I have a small model that's 30 centimetres long. It's not like the full glider that's two metres. And it allowed the kids to uh, ask some questions as they got to touch and remove the wings and uh, have, a, have a think about how these robots might work. So I had some physical concepts around buoyancy and movement in the ocean. And so this is the, this is the uh, science tool I used to understand this ocean weather and, and it was a, a mechanism to talk about you know, subsurface physical processes. So what I wanted to do was just talk you through how I conducted the, the workshops that I was involved in. So I would start with some language that was familiar to the children. So they're used to, uh, on the far left-hand side, these maps, and the maps of New Zealand. And, and uh, over the, the sort of 10-minute introduction, we would introduce more complex information. So we'd move from something they knew about and add layers of complexity. Uh, maps, satellite images uh, of all of these eddies. Uh, I use some things like textbook information that they might be familiar with, ocean uh, zones, so light that might be associated with different animals, and ultimately ended up with this picture on the far side of what the ocean really looks like when we go and measure it with an ocean robot. So these layers of salinity and temperature and talk them through some of the processes that that the glider was able to observe and introduce some concepts that might not be so familiar with them. And so uh, this, is, this is what I presented to them. Uh, and this was the talk that we gave to all of our students. Uh, it wasn't different for different ages. And what that meant was that there was often some on the fly changes to the content that we gave to them, whether there was a full school from uh, zero through to year eights, or if it was quite a uh, engaged intermediate school. So um, there was certainly, uh, it was fun, uh, but challenging in terms of the science communication that was required. And then they got to do their activity, which Gabby's talked through a little bit. So they got rope, they got these cable ties, and what they had to do in the workshops I was involved in was trying to think about what an ocean eddy might look like. Could you draw it with rope? Uh, and, and sometimes, they got really engaged and you can see uh, some amazing, you know, almost eddy-like features in the, in the background picture. And some of them were quite literal in their drawings. Some of them wanted to draw ocean gliders. 
Uh, so it was um, one of the schools and I had 180 students. And so uh, it was pretty intense in terms of an experience to answer all of their science questions from, a, from my perspective, but it was also quite invigorating that, that there was so much enthusiasm. These are some thoughts I've had about the whole proposal and uh, project, sorry, about proposal writing. Uh, the activity itself from the outset was quite broad, um, perhaps like a science proposal or a science project, not always knowing what the outcome or the intermediate steps might be. And so that was quite challenging for some of those children, you know, that are used to quite prescriptive involvement uh, and, and an outcome from the outset. But then there was these, these students that perhaps might um, not traditionally be engaged by prescriptive teaching that were able to freeform it and, and have much more unique approaches to, this, to the problem of, of, of drawing the growth. So it was quite fascinating to see the different, um, different styles. I know Gabby's got a lot to say, so I won't take too much more, but here's some feedback. And as I said, it was instantaneous. Uh, some of them took all of the things that you said and wrote it down, and that was fantastic. But there were some that were able to connect their knowledge to things that I never spoke of, and, and that was the things that were really appealing to them. So one of these kids says, um, you know, there's the layers in the ocean, which is great, but then they knew about whales and how that they could connect ocean stratification to, to animals and previous knowledge. Uh, this is this is great feedback here. So there was one child who said, what was the coolest thing they learnt? And it was nothing because they already knew everything. Um, can't help but think that this might be one of those evil reviewers in a science context. And then some of the, the children provided visual feedback. And so, uh, you know, this is this is the best feedback from, from all of the postcards that were from the workshops that I was involved in. And here we've got Gabby, we've got a, a child in the middle uh, and then myself. And so uh, it's hard to beat this, um, this sort of instantaneous feedback from this art science engagement. So that's kind of my 10 minutes. Thanks, Gabby. All right, thank you so much, Jo. Um, yeah, I, I think also what I really love about this image is the child sees herself amongst us as well um, and yeah it was also a really awesome opportunity for everyone to share success collaboratively together as well so no matter where they kind of sat um, in their experiences or expectations of learning with it being so open open-ended um, at the at the end, everyone kind of shared in the success of the group effort. Um, Joe, could you stop sharing your screen so I can? Thank you. Get to my screen now. Um, share. Awesome. And I'll just. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you, Joe and Carolyn. It's always really lovely to hear your perspectives. Um, sometimes I feel like I throw everyone into the deep end and we kind of um, improvise together using all our extreme skill sets. Um, anyway, I'll just give you a bit of background and this is what I share with the participants, no matter what their age are. Um, so I'm from Melbourne and I went to art school and studied sculpture in Melbourne. And um, my practice is very material. It is very spatial, it often uses light, and it, um, it has a, a quite a big research aspect of it um, in the development of all projects. And um, research in kind of a classical academic kind of way, as well as um, researching materials and ideas and, and um, creating connectivity between all of these things and uh, synthesizing them into an artwork. So, um, yeah, I think I'll move on. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. So um, in 2015, I was invited by Craig Stevens to um, participate in science research in Antarctica, McMurdo Sound with the oceanography team. And my, I was set with the task, which was to document and measure the sea ice crystals that form underneath the sea ice in the ocean. And um, 
I was trying to work out the different ways that I could approach this and I couldn't actually um, freeze water to have the same qualities as the sea ice, the ice crystals in Antarctica. So I made a proxy using um, packaging tape, layered up packaging tape and practiced different types of photographic techniques to ensure that um, I could um, do this documentation successfully um, with, within time constraints and also space constraints. And this is actually a, a image or an animation of a series of images of an ice crystal that was scooped out of the, um, the hole in the floor of our shipping container, um, research container. So it's a proof of concept. And so I was trying to, I suppose, um, map and get as much information out of these ice crystals as I possibly could, as well as collecting um, their size measurements for some um, data as well to work out the roughness of the underneath the sea ice because it causes eddying within the ocean below. I also, um, this research was so successful that I was re-invited the following year to um, collect more data of the same ice crystals and I kind of got to um, develop the strategy a bit further and to also increase productivity. And so each square that you see below is one centimeter. And this is just showing you a day of data. So um, you can see how different each of these crystals are. So they range in size from like the size of my little fingernail through to like almost a dinner plate as well. And um, they can be between half a millimeter to two or three millimeters thick, depending on how many layers there are. And here's a photo of me doing, um, conducting some research. And so there was just beyond myself, there is the hole into the ocean below us. And um, so I would, was able to scoop out and then document very quickly these ice crystals before they started melting and losing integrity. I also had a studio, um, one of the shipping containers that I slept in, I was able to also paint and draw and think and make as well. So I used it as a data collecting exercise. Now we're coming to um, this particular project and it's all about um, really considering how interconnected um, both the land and the oceans that we live around are. So this idea of Ki'utu Kitai, the mountains from the sea and how what happens in the hills connects to the ocean and vice versa. And also thinking about the connectivity between people as well and also processes and how it's nonlinear and very complex. And so here's a photo of one of the workshops um, that I did with Joe. This is our really big workshop and, um, and some results as well. And so one of the great things that you have is we create a lot of space for questions. So often the students are actually feeding us um, information and knowledge that is very um, place-based and very specific to their region. So, it, and it gives them more to kind of build their knowledge on. We also um, worked outdoors, um, but and this is just showing quite literally um, feedback from re Joe's research in terms of both the drawing feedback, which is thinking about the layers of the ocean, as well as um, wind rope, and then also um, drawn with pencil and paper as someone listing all the things that they learned. And this idea of the ocean being in layers was very quite captivating for the students. This is by two different students as well. It's not the same um, child. We worked in very different contexts from galleries to libraries and also conducted an outdoor classroom in the weeks leading up to the public presentation of the first version of The Unseen. And um, what was quite exciting about this was the students we're not only just making the work together and seeing it grow, but then they got to pick it up and install it directly in the exhibition. And they got to see how um, their collaborations within their groups were collaborating and connecting to at a distance um, with other communities within their region from you know, Marlborough and through Nelson. Um, and just wanna show, this is just another kind of 
an image of a range of feedback and just shows the different ranges of um, science that we presented as well. So from oceanography, marine ecology, fish and coral. And um, we also had a whale and dolphin acoustics researcher as well. And um, yeah, and so there was quite a range and it was very open-ended. And so the project was designed as, as a, um, like us, we we're creating the conditions for um, a really broad amount of kind of thinking and responses. And from the outset, um, there was no kind of wrong answer. A non-answer was, was acceptable as well. And this is one of, um, a, I don't want to call it a favorite, but it's quite significant feedback where this student is one of, with Carolyn, we talk about mangroves and estuaries, but this, this um, participant saying that when the rain goes on the mud and the mud goes out to sea and then it kills the shells. And what they actually thought, like what would they do? They came up with the, their own science research question. And this actually happened quite a number of times throughout the process. So they would research how long the sea creatures can survive under the water when the mud comes down. And, you know, and I think that's quite an important thing that um, they were really, it shows how much they care and um, showing that they are thinking about um, solutions to problems that they hadn't had to consider before. So here's um, the finished version of the first iteration of the project. Um, it's at the, just next to the Suta Art Gallery in Nelson. And so it's about 50 metres long and about 20 plus metres wide. And we used about 10 kilometres of rope and cable ties. And um, at the conclusion of the project, we're reusing the materials multiple times. But I've also saved these connected drawings because they're connected into small groups. And they're in storage at the moment in Hamilton and they will be re-exhibited for my final exhibition which we'll talk about a bit later. And then at the very, very conclusion, um, we're going to take apart all the materials and the rope will be, some will be saved for future projects of this nature, but some will also be gifted to community groups or schools as um, sports equipment, rope for all sorts of different uses um, to continue its life cycle. And the um, cable ties will also um, go into a specialist um, plastics recycler to turn into design objects as well. So it was very important that um, we kind of had a sustainability strategy for the project and that we were able to um, yeah, perform. So this is a, I suppose one of my very first important questions and it was a question when um, my research appeared to be much simpler and it's just thinking that we, you know, we're combining with my practice, both art and science, and we're making this new thing called art science, but it's not, it's not that easy. And it's much, much more interdisciplinary um, than that. And also it's not an addition either because a true collaboration is a multiplication and an expansion of um, the, all the um, components and the contributors. And with my practice, I think about, um, you know, the art or the, the outcomes are a byproduct or a combination of both ideas, materials and audiences. And these all work together kind of sometimes at tension and, um, and more harmoniously, but they are the essential kind of components of an artwork. And um, for this particular project, the um, image on the right, we're thinking we're also adding um, so science is the idea, but place is a very, very important kind of um, additional component because it allows both the science to be discussed in context, but also the art to be um, positioned in context as well. And that's called site specific in arts practice. Um, so when I was trying to work out this art science and you know educational community project. I was trying to work out what all, where all the commonalities between these disciplines are and how to kind of um, group them. But actually, it started getting out of hand, and um, you can see that there are so many different kind of concepts and areas of knowledge that are intersecting and kind of complicating things. And um, I realised that um, yeah, it's it's not 
sometimes I was, I was being told that maybe I should try and like um, reduce this down to simplify the silos of knowledge, but actually th this works because of this expansiveness. So my practice along with this project is the idea of trying to understand something that's out of you, outside of your kind of realm of knowledge. And so um, the way with this project, we're trying to understand how things work, for example, marine ecosystems, to then understand how they may change, you know, in regard to say climate change. Um, but what happens in this project as well, you get to also accumulate and perform all these other kind of um, aspects of sense making and knowledge um, through empathy, imagining, etc. And so it kind of enriches this acquisition of new knowledge. And so my PhD title is about communicating climate change, which is the idea of risk to communities, which is trust and through the art science nexus, which creates hope. And so the whole project is through this kind of risk, trust, hope kind of um, so I suppose paradigm where, because um, we're, we're not even trying to talk about the words risk um, as well, because with communities, you don't want to kind of create fear as well. So we actually need to, um, for them to trust the knowledge that we have and want to share in order to create hope as opposed to hopelessness, which um, is something that is quite attributed to a lot of feelings around climate change. And one of the things that I realized that we need to consider um, in terms of both um, people and communities is that we are connected to place and other communities in very many overlapping ways. And it expands both community and geography and is attached to identity and experience. And so often um, people are, you know, stratified as to stakeholders and public and different things and places very kind of located but also we have you know this um, other space that we occupy which is this zoom space as well as social media space so our geographies are very um, much more flexible and fluid and it means that we are connected more um, with than um, we often give credit to so in regard to climate change communication, um, we use, we're using, I suppose it's an education engagement model, but we're doing it through narrative um, with communities and, and through art, but it's all grounded in place. And so narrative is very important. And you know, the oldest method of communicating is telling stories and narrative is how we kind of um, retain stories as well. And so we are combining both stories from the scientist perspective, artist perspective, and also the stories of the participants that we all combine together to create this art, is this new knowledge. And all art is created in social, political, geographic, cultural context and historical context. So it, it doesn't ever exist outside of this. And so that context is also um, complicates both the ideas, materials and audiences and the space, which could also be a gallery and the art that's produced. And so there's multiple influences on everything that you know, we make and the way that we read it and interpret it. So one of the things that I've had to kind of devise um, through experience as well is um, a different way of methodology for my project as a way of understanding it because um, I was presenting at conferences outside of my area of knowledge, so from geography and um, education and, and more. Um, and what I was finding is that um, people from different education backgrounds would interpret my practice um, in their terms. So it's this kind of form that you'll see, people see their, um, see their biases and their knowledge reflected back at them as a form of sense making. And so although disco ball methodology, it seems like it's quite playful, it's more showing this kind of fractured way that we um, make sense and which shows all these different influences and biases that we have, you know, from cultural, personal, from our own experiences and expertise and our values, affiliations, etc., and how they, all these things combine to influence the way that we um, both interpret 
research and knowledge and experience. So um, one of the a really big thing that I've realized is um, thinking about you know the participant as of any workshop as being part of an ecosystem of like community and society and how um, we all have exist in multiple kind of communities in that are both spatial and and as well as um, family and workplace etc so um, and the strategy that we've used is the, this idea of trickling up and out knowledge so from the participant out to their community as well and um, and if we think that you know we have up to 160 180 people in, in a single workshop um, you know this is multiple kind of puddles rippling out and intersecting and realizing that um, the idea of stakeholders and public it's non-linear it's very very three-dimensional and complicated um, and also effective and here's another illustration of the same concept but the idea that you know this is all feeding in and turning in on top of itself as well so it's not just one directional this kind of um, transferal of information it's often folding back in on itself so let's get to the results so um what one of the things that i realized is that there's off there was a perception that um a art science project was going to be biased um, for art because art was the delivery system and also um, the main tangible byproduct of the project and so we had this kind of postcard questionnaire which is very very open-ended and, um, and not kind of biased towards any area of knowledge we just wanted to know one main thing that the students felt like they they learnt and one thing that they might like to do using any of the um, the areas of knowledge that we shared with them and what was quite surprising to me was 78% um, of the feedback was only science so only science fact and only science research questions and drawings as well depending on the literacy and the interests of the participants and then we have 18 percent of um, participants reported back you know combination of art and science and only one percent had art only and the three percent of unclear um, also included like a non non-answer or something that I couldn't um, quite understand um, or it said I don't know and we this was a totally valid um, way of responding to this and so this is from about 400 participants I had another section of um, feedback as well a similar amount and the responses are very um, similar as well which was um, similar um, percentages as well so it's really interesting to see how effective art can be at communicating science and complex science and how also communities have much more capacity than we possibly um, realize and this comes to the idea of the way that we kind of take on knowledge as well and so it's a constructed experience and educationally and pedagogically we i'm using the idea of constructivist constructivism which is also a term in art as well the idea of building knowledge building things and um, so our previous knowledge and experience affects the way we take on new knowledge and experience but also then creates capacity and receptivity for future knowledge and creates knowledge links and loops and but often the way that we this project specifically we use not only kind of oral and written and visual kind of um, ways of experiencing knowledge but we also have tacit like using our hands and our bodies and um, we also are not expecting participants to take on a full list of information they will just take bits and pieces that make sense to them or that have interest to them and it allows them to kind of have autonomy of what they actually take on and then that knowledge um, sticks a lot a um, lot better as well and allows for that um, future receptivity and capacity 
but also the really lovely thing that happens for the um, us as workshop leaders is not only are we sharing and doing it in multiple different ways so through watching listening for this participants you know embodying making and discussions the discussions happen as large groups but also one-on-one -on -one where the scientists and myself will help individuals with their work um, but we're also there's so much sharing going on um, so we are learning through this process as well it's not one way it's not um, didactic I um, just want to get on to what's happened with this project. So part of my assessment will be... Excuse me, Gabby, I'm yep. just going to interrupt. We've only got five more minutes left oh, of the okay. webinar. So oh, we'll have to... Um, Sorry, I'll do really fast. I'll just yeah, we might forward. have to skip forward to the yep. Q&A session. Yep. And um, if everyone could yep. start typing in their questions and yep. I'll... We'll yep. get them going. Oh, so. so sorry. Um, There's yeah, a lot saying, to talk about. Yeah, just saying that my project is going to have a second exhibition component in Papakura in Auckland, but um, it was due during this COVID lockdown in New Zealand. And so it's being rescheduled, but I'm not exactly sure when and how, but through that I had to analyse what would be lost through this um, reducing the project from being a very intense, collaborative, relational and um, tangible collaboration. So it went from here to losing all of this and then it would shift. Um, and what I ended up doing was the idea of waiting it out. And so, because I realized the, um, this relational um, way of making together that is also place-based is actually more important value-wise. And um, I'll just leave it here. This just shows a lot of the outcomes which were unexpected. And that just is because of this whole risk, trust, hope paradigm as well, where um, it's resulted in more than we could expect and anticipate um, and thank you and sorry that I talked for so long <laughs> all right thank you Gabby all right so we have four minutes left for question time I'm sorry for not keeping you on track Gabby my um, my mistake so if anyone has any questions please um, put your hand up um, in the chat or type your type your question um, I am just trying to see if anyone has any questions. I'll give you a few seconds to type. Um, but actually, in the meantime, while every uh, you're typing your questions out, I have a question for Carolyn and Joe. How has your or can you ex uh, comment very quickly on your experience from the workshop and how that's influenced how you communicate your science today? Uh, so, Carolyn and Joe, I'll unmute you both. Okay, I think you had me muted. So, I'm mute, unmuted now, so, um, so I can go first. I, I think it's particularly been helpful in um, making sure when we're speaking, no matter who the audience is, that we're um, using terms that people can understand and trying to make sure that, you know, we don't throw out all sorts of jargon that, um, you know, people have no idea what it is. And, um, you know, I go back and I, I think I'm, I'm going to do a shout out to my mom because she's actually on the call now. But when I was a graduate student in all of my practice talks, I used to give them to my parents at home and they would ask me questions about, you know, well, why are you talking about dispersal? I don't understand what that word is. What do you mean? And so it really helped me to actually bring back to make sure, you know, the terminology we use when we're speaking, even to a science audience might be to a particular set of scientists and our colleagues in oceanography or in ecotoxicology may have no idea what the ecologists are talking about. So, Joe. Um, I, I've, I've not really adjusted the way that I talk in terms of communicating my science. I guess what I learned from the experience was how much knowledge, um, you know, a whole range of these participants were able to take on. So giving them credit for their own information and knowledge that they get from books or YouTube or wherever. And they were, you know, they cope with a lot of the complexity that often we try and simplify, which perhaps isn't as necessary as, you know, I thought as a scientist. 
Awesome. Thanks, Carolyn and Joe. And we have another question for you both from Alana. Uh, she asks, would you consider incorporating artists higher upstream in your research, such as creating hypothesis and doing research with you? Has your work with Gabby influenced your answer to this? I'll let Joe go first this time. Hey. Uh, I think that there's certainly a way to, to rethink how we might include artists and in communicating science better through these sorts of tools. Um, you know, I guess we're often stuck in our ways of the tools that we use, and so it's re rethinking about that. Um, I don't have a, you know, we haven't yet included it in future proposals, but it, it, it's been a really effective way of, of communicating, and so um, we should rethink this. Thank you. And I, I think it's important to point out, I know, um, you know, this is a Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, but this as well as other National Science Challenges have had many um, art components. So, you know, I think it's wonderful that, you know, at that National Science Challenge level that we're embracing the art and um, bringing more to our science. Um, we had a webinar with Duhana Smith yesterday where not a similar, but you know, similar in that it was an art science collaboration project was used in the Deep South Challenge. So um, I think that these collaborations are certainly becoming far more commonplace and really adding to both disciplines. Yeah, well, thank you both. And um, related to that answer, we've got a question from Andrea Grant, um, who wonders what the role creativity played in the bridge between art and science. So. If um, anyone can comment on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a small comment on that. I think what um, we're demonstrating through, within the presentation workshop processes is that there's a lot of similarity between art and science. You know, we're both trying to answer questions. We go through a research process and often it's nonlinear and sometimes it happens through accident. A discovery happens accidentally. Sometimes it's built up and acquired um, as well. So I think... Um, often they're separated as being very, very different, you know, and maybe that's more to do with the way that um, society prioritises, um, you know, both in education and elsewhere, you know, the way things are funded. But, um, yeah, I think there is a lot more similarity than there is, is often accounted for. Awesome, thank you. And we have a question from Leah Carroll. Hi, Leah. Um, I wonder if there has been a time which you created the art first and then discovered a scientific concept through that art making. I guess I think that was potentially yeah. for Gabby. Um, I've what's interesting is I've had some past projects um, where where a, another scientist who hasn't been involved with and can see their own research in it. So, for example, the iceberg work that's using the geometry quite heavily within it and um, yeah and so I found that interesting so it's not that I'm making a scientific discovery but I know that um, but it's revealing something scientific to the viewer. Um, I also know that through conducting research in Antarctica that um, I and also a lack of shyness I would ask a lot of questions of the scientists that they probably I weren't used to because we go about our practice, um, you know, unconsciously sometimes as well. And so that, and also it led to other kind of thinking around the science and conversations as well. But I'm not sure about if it's making scientific discovery. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll wrap up because I'm conscious of time and time is important. So this is last question from Andrea Grant, um, directed to Gabby. Where are the crossovers in our art and science practice? If you could have a quick word on that. Um, crossovers, I think um, we all have a lot of skills and, tech and um, I think what I realised both my practice and with the scientists that I've worked with is we're all very collaborative and it all relies on those kind of relationships and um, the ability to um, often try things out that you don't know what the answer is going to be and um, but also trusting and taking a risk in that as well so um, I 
yeah, I'm not exactly answering that very directly, <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, art is often perceived as not rigorous and not academic and, um, but, you know, I'm just trying to show that, um, you know, art is rigorous and can have multiple outputs that are possibly unexpected. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Gabby. And one more question from Alana, and then I promise I will wrap up. I think it is, could be a yes or no question from Alana. Was jargon an issue during this com collaboration between, between the three of you? No. No. <laughs> I no. Not really. It must yeah. be because if any of us don't understand something, we immediately ask and yeah. you know, there's no stupid question, just ask. Yeah, no. And I think also, you know, we're, we're all just learning about each other's work as, about, as well as about our own work. And, you know, you can only do that through asking questions. And yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here today. And I really appreciate the time you've all taken out to be here. Um, this, this talk has been recorded and will be on our, the Sustainable Seas YouTube channel. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And thank you all for being here. Bye. Thank you.